You're traveling through deep space, circling stars and entire galaxies. Whoa, looks like this multicolored nebula will soon collapse under its own weight and explode like a supernova. Now let's carefully circle this black hole. Try not to get caught in its gravitational field, or it'll swallow you like a space monster. Hmm, wait, what's that strange structure right there? It's a glowing wall. And if you look closely, each glowing dot is an entire galaxy. That wall has about 100,000 of these galaxies. The Milky Way has 100 billion stars. So this wall holds a quadrillion, that's 10 followed by 15 zeros, of stars like our sun. This giant structure is called the South Pole Wall. It's located about 500 million light years from Earth. By comparison, the closest star to our home is Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.2 light years away. Rockets can cover that distance in about 73,000 years. So the journey to the South Pole Wall may take longer than our solar system exists. And this wall is simply gigantic, even on a cosmic scale. It's about 1.37 billion light years long. To give you an idea of how large that is, the Milky Way is only 100,000 light years wide. But you can't see this wall even with the most powerful telescope. The problem is that the Milky Way itself obstructs your view. It's so bright that it's hiding this wall. It's like trying to look at the starry sky in a metropolis. The light pollution won't let you do that. Scientists have been able to detect this galactic wall by measuring redshift. We know that all objects in the universe are moving. They spread out from each other as a result of the Big Bang, which happened billions of years ago. And when galaxies move, their light waves change slightly. By measuring this change, we can understand what the object is and how it moves. And this wall isn't even the largest in our universe. This is the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. It's a giant flat superstructure about 10 billion light years wide. That's around 10% of the entire observable universe. And it's also a wall. That is, a cluster of galaxies. We were able to detect this giant structure by gamma ray bursts. It's the brightest electromagnetic event in the universe. You could even see it in the far reaches of our universe. Such bursts are a very rare event. In the Milky Way, for example, it happens once every few million years. If we notice many such bursts in a short time from the same place, it means that there are many objects like the Milky Way in that place. So, there are a lot of galaxies out there. Another unusual giant structure in the universe is the huge, large quasar group. It's about 4 billion light years across. So, it takes a photon of light almost as long as our planet has existed, just to get from one side of the structure to the other. And if you put the huge, large quasar group on the scale, it would be 6.1 billion billion times heavier than our sun. Scientists have found that there are at least 73 quasars in that structure. These are some of the most unusual objects in the universe. They are the active cores of galaxies. At the center of a quasar is a supermassive black hole. This giant eats up the matter around it. A wild force of gravity twists the matter around the black hole, forming a disk. And this disk is the source of the strongest radiation out there. By comparison, the radiation from a single quasar is tens or hundreds of times stronger than that of all the stars in our galaxy put together. Because of such strong radiation, we can detect quasars, even at very long distances. That's why they're also called beacons of the universe. Scientists use quasars to study the universe and the movement within it. One of the most distant quasars from us is about 13.1 billion light years away. This makes it one of the oldest objects in the universe. It appeared about 690 million years after the Big Bang, and it's almost three times older than our solar system. It's still glowing with extreme brightness, about 4 and 14 zeros times brighter than the sun. Scientists explain that at the center of the giant is a supermassive black hole, 800 million times heavier than the sun. All these giant structures are just building blocks of our universe. Look, this is our solar system. Now, zoom out a little, and this is where our home star is in the Milky Way galaxy. Zoom out again. Here's a local group of galaxies. All the bright spots here are galaxies. Here's Andromeda. And here's the Triangulum galaxy, plus a few dozen other slightly smaller galaxies. They're all gravitationally connected. The size of this structure is about 10 million light years. 
that's 100 times the width of our galaxy. Zoom out, please. This one is the Virgo Supercluster. It's 20 times larger than the local group. There are about 30,000 different galaxies. And the mass of the whole thing is about 1 in 15 zeros solar masses. Zoom out again. Laniakea. This structure is almost three times larger. It includes the Virgo Supercluster and other smaller clusters. And there are about 100,000 galaxies here. Huh, it's not over yet. Zoom out one more time. Here's the Pisces Cetus Supercluster Complex. This giant galactic structure contains about 60 clusters of galaxies. So there are more galaxies in it than grains of sand in the desert. You know what to do. Zoom out! Phew, this is the observable universe. There are over 500 billion galaxies. And the stars? Well, there are about 1 billion trillion stars. The observable universe has its own structure. Clusters of galaxies form chains and walls, as you've seen before. But these strands are separated by huge regions of absolute emptiness. These areas are called voids. In these places, there is no matter at all. There are fewer molecules in the voids than in an empty room. One of these voids has a very mystical reputation. It's the Eridnus Supervoid, or the Cold Spot. It appeared here only 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's almost 1 billion light years wide and could hold hundreds or thousands of galaxies with trillions of stars. Some scientists believe that this cold spot may have been the result of the largest collision ever. A collision of universes. There's a theory that our universe is some kind of bubble, a huge sphere that contains all these walls and chains of galaxies. Now imagine that there's an infinite number of these bubbles. They could be parallel worlds or different universes. Many years ago, one bubble came close to the bubble of our universe. Their walls touched and the two universes connected for a while. It's like two drops of water coming together. But that universe kept moving. The area where the bubbles joined became thinner and thinner until that connection broke and the two bubbles detached from each other. At this point, the second universe ripped some of the material out of our bubble. All those galaxies that used to fill the Eridinus supervoid ended up in a parallel universe. Scientists supposed we might travel through other bubbles. Flying to the supposed wall of our universe would take forever. And then it would take even longer to fly through interuniversal space. So we have to use portals or wormholes. Here's how it works. Imagine a piece of paper with point A on one side and point B on the other. Instead of moving all the way across the sheet of paper, we just fold the sheet so that point A is right above point B. All that's left to do is make a small hole, and the journey takes only moments. Some scientists believe that such shortcuts through universes lie inside black holes. But how do you survive falling into a black hole? You just have to pick one that's big enough. It's all about gravity. Imagine you're falling into a black hole right now. The closer you get to it, the stronger effect it has on you. It intensifies with every inch. At one point, the gravitational force that affects your head is much stronger than the one that affects your feet. Then you turn into spaghetti. Yum. But if you choose a supermassive black hole, like the ones at the centers of galaxies, the gravitational force in them increases gradually. They can be millions of times heavier than the sun and much bigger. But the gravitational force on your head and your feet will be almost equal, and you will still feel comfortable. Who knows? Maybe if you managed to survive a fall into such a massive black hole, you'd find yourself in a completely different universe where different laws of physics apply. But so far, this is just a theory. Weird, unusual sounds out of nowhere are spreading all over our galaxy, constantly repeating, and it's something we've never heard before. Scientists discovered it in 2020 and it was nothing like any of the other energy signatures they ever studied. Powerful and bright radio signals occurring from time to time, mysteriously disappearing within a day. It doesn't fit the profile of any space body we know. The signal is a bit irritating, and it disappears without a schedule. When scientists tried to match the signal with some other telescopes, it was gone. Low-mass stars sometimes flare up with radio energy, 
but not here, since they mostly have X-ray counterparts. Very dense collapsed stars, like pulsars and magnetars, are also not a choice. The closest solution they got is a mysterious class of objects we know as the Galactic Center Radio Source, GCRT. It's a radio source that brightens and rapidly glows. It decays near the center of our galaxy and could help us unravel the mysteries of the universe. If you had a flying car that could go up at a speed of 60 miles per hour, you'd only need one hour to get into space. The moon is a little bit farther, 250,000 miles, which is about 10 times the circumference of our planet. That means a moon trip would be like taking a tour around the globe and doing it 10 times straight, which would take less than six months. A trip to Pluto would take over 800 years. Proxima b is the closest Earth-like neighbor we have. It's a small rocky world that orbits the closest stellar neighbor of our Sun. It orbits the star's habitable zone, an area that's far enough from any star to have moderate conditions, not too cold and not too hot for liquid water to at least hypothetically exist. If you tried to travel to Proxima b at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour, which is the speed of the Apollo moon rockets, it would take you over 112,000 years to get there. You might not be able to breathe there. No one knows if Proxima b has an atmosphere. Humans explore the universe all the time, but we can only see around 5% of the matter up there. And Albert Einstein was the first one that realized the empty space is not really nothing. The rest we can't see is actually made up of invisible matter, also known as dark matter. It's about 27%. Combined with something called dark energy, which is 68%. If you try to pour water into space, of course, outside of a spacecraft, it would immediately boil away or vaporize. That's because there's no air or air pressure in space. As air pressure lowers, the temperature you'd usually need to boil water at also gets lower. Keeping that in mind, water boils way faster on a mountaintop than, for example, at sea level. There's no air pressure in space, so water could boil at a very low temperature. Scientists believe that there are at least a couple of billion galaxies out there. We don't know the real number, and probably never will, but they tried to calculate it by counting how many galaxies we can see in a pretty small and restricted area of the sky. It may seem as if the universe was filled with stars and a couple of planets here and there, but our home galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. If you fill a balloon with helium and release it, you'll notice it floats very high. It'll go up into the atmosphere, but it won't go into outer space. The higher you go, the thinner the air in our atmosphere gets. Your balloon will rise up until the point where the atmosphere surrounding it has the same weight as the helium inside it. That will happen at approximately a height of 20 miles above the surface. So this is as far as a helium balloon can rise. We don't really know how big the universe is. We can't see its edges, nor do we know if it even has an edge. We use technology to see out to a distance of around 14 billion light years from our planet. This means we can see around 28 billion light years in diameter across, starting with the outermost layer of our atmosphere that ends at around 600 miles above our planet's surface. Although the size of the universe is constantly changing and gets bigger through time. Mercury is closest to the sun, so most people think it's the hottest planet too. Still, Venus is the hottest planet. It's the second planet away from our central star, around 30 million miles farther from the Sun compared to Mercury. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is like some sort of a warming blanket that helps maintain the heat coming from the Sun. Venus has an unexpectedly thick atmosphere, around 100 times thicker than the one we have. Its atmosphere doesn't let the heat out, it just keeps it and constantly makes Venus hotter and hotter. Also, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide that freely lets solar energy in. But it's less transparent to lose long wavelength radiations that the warm heated surface emits. The average temperature there is around 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt tin. 
the maximum temperature on its neighbor, Mercury, is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. In maybe two or more billion years, it will be way too hot for life to exist on our precious planet. As the hundreds of millions of years go by, our sun will keep getting hotter and brighter. Eventually, temperatures will be so high, our beautiful oceans will be wiped away. Since they produce 70% of the oxygen we need to survive, there will be no life without them. All of this means that our planet will simply become a vast desert, something like Mars is today. Pluto, a very distant used-to-be planet, now dwarf planet, is actually smaller in diameter than the entire US. The biggest distance there, from Maine to Northern California, is approximately 2,900 miles, while Pluto is only 1,473 miles across. Pluto is very far, but the edge of our solar system is 1,000 times farther away than this dwarf planet. But astronomers found many space objects orbiting our Sun way farther than Pluto, such as Kuiper Belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects. There's also an Oort comet cloud that goes half a light year from Pluto, also 1,000 times farther. A neutron star is really heavy. Just a teaspoon filled with it would weigh 6 billion tons. Neutron stars are something that remain from huge stars that have run out of fuel. The fading star explodes, and its core falls apart. But, due to gravity, it forms an extremely dense neutron star. These stars typically have a mass of up to three suns. But the radius there is around six miles, because this is one of the densest things in our universe, at least that we know about. The universe has a color, and it averages to be some kind of beige or, as they call it, cosmic latte. It also has its own smell that reminds you of seared steak or hot metal. At least, that's something astronauts floating in space have said. If you want to build a spacesuit, get ready to work really hard. It takes 5,000 hours to make it and will cost you a million dollars. A really good one will have 11 layers of material and weighs about 110 pounds, and it needs to be comfortable. You'll need more space in there because you grow up to two inches when in space. When you're floating around in space, Earth's gravity doesn't have any impact on you. That's why the vertebrae in your spine might expand and relax a little bit, which means you'll be maybe 3% taller. For six feet, it's about two extra inches. Oh, don't worry, it's not permanent. As soon as you go down to Earth, you'll shrink back down to your normal size within a couple of months. Space isn't the best option if you want to have a conversation with your friend. Because up there, sound doesn't travel at all. Molecules there are so far apart that sound vibrations can't reach them, which automatically means they can't vibrate, so we can't hear them. Movies are not accurate with this. No one could hear you screaming in space, too. We kind of live inside our sun. The sun is not just that big hot ball of light located 93 million miles away from us. Its outer atmosphere is way bigger. It extends far beyond the surface we can see. Our planet's orbit goes through its tenuous atmosphere. The evidence is when gusts of the solar wind generate the southern and northern lights. That means, in some way, we live inside the sun. Not just us, other planets too, including distant Neptune. The heliosphere, which is what we call the outer solar atmosphere, extends to about 10 billion miles. Dozens of spacecraft and hundreds of probes take off from Earth and head for our planet's twin sister, Venus. It's about the same size as the Earth and has around 80% of our planet's mass. The temperatures here are too high for humans, and it doesn't have the air we're used to breathing. But we went there because scientists recently found traces of phosphine gas, which suggests that life might be there. Phosphine comes from various microbes and bacteria, so humanity goes on this journey to discover this life. With our technology, a flight to Venus would take three and a half to six and a half months, but we finally made it. Spaceships are landing on the planet, and when the first humans come to the surface, they see heat-scorched deserts, lava lakes, and geysers of poisonous acid. And that's it. 
Scientists miscalculated the radio telescope data. Phosphine never existed on Venus. So we're going back to the rockets, and we're getting ready for a longer trip across our galaxy. The scientists believe that there's at least 36 civilizations in the Milky Way that are similar to ours. They could be living organisms completely different from us. They may have different bodies, different eyes. They may walk and talk in a very different way than we do. But an advanced civilization has several criteria, technological progress, and the use of developed communication between individuals. So these civilizations must explore space, build cities, and be able to communicate with each other as independent species. Let's look at our galaxy and find these civilized worlds. So, the Milky Way is a spiral of 100,000 light years from side to side. If a star is born at one end of it in a super powerful blast, the light from that event won't even reach the other end until 100,000 years later. There's about 100 billion stars, and near each of them, there may be worlds similar to our solar system. Let's try to find these habitable worlds using giant seas. First, we look for stars that have a lot of iron. Such stars burn at the perfect temperature for the development of life. And the iron in the star system will help form the cores of planets that will be home to another civilization. We sift the Milky Way through our sieve. We see that there are too many stars that fit the description. So we need another filter. Now let's find stars that look like the sun in this pile. The star must be about 100 times larger than the Earth and 333,000 times heavier. An important criterion is the age of the star. When a star gets old, it begins to expand and turns into a red giant. At this time, it can absorb the planets around it. The life of such a star can end with a huge blast that destroys everything around it. So the star we're looking for must be relatively young. Let's use our sieve again. There's fewer stars, but still that's a lot. Now let's focus on the planets. They should be in the habitable zone of the star, not too close to a star because then the temperature would be too high for life to be born and not too far away. Then the planet would just be an ice block with nothing living on it. The temperature of the planet must allow the water to remain liquid. Another filter is the age of the candidate planet. It takes time for an advanced civilization to develop. Based on the experience of Earth, scientists believe that it takes at least 4.5 billion years for any life form to evolve to the human level. So we're looking for planets similar to Earth or older. We use our sieve one last time, and voila, we have 36 worlds where an advanced civilization is possible. Scientists conducted this study and published it in April 2020, based on these very criteria. All that's left is to discover these civilizations and make the first contact. We can detect such a civilization by using radio waves that come from it. Suppose there's a planet A, with primitive living organisms on it, millions of years of evolution, and they'll become a civilization with advanced technology. Radio waves will be the way they communicate. Then the whole planet will emit radio waves like a star emits light. And here on Earth, we'll be able to pick up this signal with antennas pointed into space. But there's a problem with the distance between the planets. For example, planet A is 1,000 light years away from the Earth. When planet A starts emitting radio waves, these signals won't reach us until 10 centuries later. We learned to emit and receive radio waves in 1895. And if the civilization on planet A emitted a radio signal at the same time, we won't be able to pick up that signal until 2895. It'll be the same on planet A. We sent a message in the form of a radio signal into space in 1974. In this signal, we encoded our number system, human DNA, and information about our solar system. If there's an advanced civilization on planet A, they'll be able to receive this signal only in 2974 and we'd have to wait another millennium to get a response from them. Another problem with radio waves is that they don't look like a constant glow on the planet, but like a flare. Radio waves are only used at a certain stage of civilization. At first, it's the primary method of communication, but then we begin to use cell phones, cable TV, and fiber optics. And as technology advances further, our radio wave light begins to fade out. So we only have about 100 years of active radio use by civilization to find it. One day, we caught a strange radio signal of an unknown origin. Its characteristics suggested that the signal was created artificially, perhaps by an outer space civilization or a passing starship. Further searches for this signal given no results, and this gave rise to many theories and arguments as to what it really was. It could have been a signal from Earth that reflected off a satellite flying through the sky, or it could have been the traces of a comet a few light years away. But let's assume it was a civilization from outer space, one of those 36 that probably exist. Now we need to make contact with them. So we throw our luggage into a rocket and head out in the direction of our suspected planet. 
Our rockets can fly at 17,600 miles per hour. That means a rocket could cross the entire United States in just eight minutes. But even if an advanced civilization lived near our closest star, Proxima Centauri, it would take us about 73,000 years to get there. Even at the speed of light, it would take 4.2 years. So we need to solve the problem of space travel. Our scientists plan to reach about a quarter of the speed of light with a laser. A powerful laser beam from Earth will push a microscopic probe in the right direction. This probe could reach our destination in about 17 years. And in another four years, when the signal from it reaches Earth, we'll know if there's an advanced civilization. Another possibility for faster than light travel is the warp bubble spacecraft. The spacecraft would have to compress space in front of it and stretch it behind its tail. Then we'll be able to reach any point in the universe in literally a few seconds. But such travel remains a fantasy for us. Perhaps we can get to different corners of the universe through wormholes. They're shortcuts similar to tunnels, but there's one problem. These wormholes might be inside black holes. They're the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy that even light can't escape their trap. Our spaceships wouldn't stand the tension either. There's also a theory that Earth is unique because it was born under completely accidental circumstances. Four and a half billion years ago, our planet was a block of lava that began to cool and solidify, but its tranquility was broken by an asteroid the size of an entire planet flying by. The collision occurred at such an angle that the Earth was not completely destroyed, but part of the asteroid remained in our orbit. A heavy rock near our planet stabilized Earth's rotation, and the gravitational interaction with the giant debris caused our core to heat up. In addition, the asteroid brought a lot of water to Earth. Such a collision is extremely unlikely. It's like winning the lottery, many times in a row. But so far, we have no reason to believe life in outer space exists. Just as we have no reason to believe that there's no advanced civilizations in the universe, except for ours.